All right, we could not be more excited to introduce our next guest. He is a comedian, a writer, a director, an actor, producer, and editor. He also makes music, which is often heard in his films, and we heard that he dabbles in magic as well. From the state to Stella, wet, hot American summer to the 10, wainy days to children's hospital, role models to wonderlust to they came together and so much more. It is an absolute honor to welcome David Wayne to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time, David. Hey, guys. Thrilled to be here. Konnichiwa. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, your style of comedy has such a unique signature to it, unlike anything that I've ever seen. I know absurdist comedy is nothing new, but there's a particular brilliance in the way you pull it off so effectively. Who or what inspired that style? Well, I would say that I was inspired by like most people, I guess, everything in my childhood, I, I loved when my sisters, I had much older sisters, and they brought home with their boyfriends, Steve Martin comedy albums. And I got really into Steve Martin and uh, Betamax taping his specials on um, NBC uh, at the time in the 70s. And then also watching tapes of Woody Allen movies. Um, I think those were some of the most early big forming moments. And then of course, staying up late and watching Saturday Night Live and all the soup of things growing up in Shaker Heights, Ohio and among Jews and it just sort of um, my friends and and uh, making jokes and performing for my family and it all kind of mixed together to create my personality and my desire to, to pick, make people laugh, I guess. It works. It seems like it's a it's a nice collaboration of great, strange minds coming together to one up each other almost. Um, <laughs> You went to NYU film school where you were a founding member of the new group, which would later be known as The State, and your sketch comedy would land on MTV in 19, uh, 1993. So with nearly 30 years and well over 30 impressive credits between now and then, how, how would you define that part of your life looking back today? Well, I, I feel like The State was a absolutely a unique and, and amazing time and experience, you know, starting that group in college and being involved all through college and then staying and doing stuff in MTV and everything uh, all the way through till um, the late 90s. And um, it was such a joy and a gift to be able to work together with my friends from college in a professional setting. And it, it made the transition from being a student to being a professional almost non-existent. So we just kept doing what we do and then started getting paid for it. So it, we, we recognized at the time how lucky and incredible it was, and we learned from each other. And in a lot of ways, the other people in the state were my teachers and mentors, uh, and, and I them, instead of us, instead of having some older, more experienced people. So maybe that's part of what contributed to having a unique sensibility. But um, it was every, every sort of stage of things has been rewarding and challenging in different ways. And so it's, I feel very lucky. So, something I've always appreciated about your work from the earliest work to the most recent is there's always been that, like, almost like somebody that's new, that's just figuring, that's not afraid to experiment. It, it has that quality. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I, I sometimes I, I think all of comedy for me is just getting out of the way of your instincts and not second guessing what you first think. And I, I, a lot of times I had to define what we do is, you know, you make some joke at the dinner table and then you're like, ha that would be so funny, but now let's do our job. And I like to not have that distinction. That's, that's a perfect description of your work. Yeah. Getting, getting away, getting out of, you know, getting away out of yourself. Yeah. Almost that's, like drunk, yeah. being drunk. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> uh, uh, now, David, in 2001, you gave the world wet, hot American summer. When you're making something, you hope for the best, but you, you never really know how something will be received. While you were making this, what were your expectations? And was there e ever even a moment that you thought it would become the cult classic that it has? Really, no. Um, I knew we all loved it. Uh, Michael Showalter and I had worked on it for years beforehand, and we were so, so happy that we were getting it made. We couldn't believe it. Um, and every day was like a fantasy come true. Um, and I had never been on a professional film set before, and I'd never directed a real crew before. And it was so many firsts. Um, but it was a tiny budget film in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And every part of it was so difficult that we just 
we would my goal at the time was just to finish it um and hope that it gets seen by somebody and really the real pie in the sky wish was that it would get a theatrical release at the time um and the idea that it would be still a movie that people talk about and watch 20 years later no that was not in in my thoughts at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember watching the um the behind the scenes on the dvd for that movie and i was so blown away by how just disastrous the elements were to the production like it rained a majority of the days that you guys were scheduled to shoot you sort of count on a little bit of luck and the luck that we were counting on was that it wouldn't rain every f-ing day and yeah. uh, what it just what i'm curious is how did you like because when you're bogged down under all the, like the the technical side of production and then there's things going wrong and you're trying to make something that's funny like how how did you approach that under such ridiculous conditions and keep it to where I mean, you produced a very hilarious film? Thank you. Well, I I think I learned on that one something that I continued to learn over and over again in my career is that filmmaking is a is always a balance between the logistical realities of what you're trying to do and your inner fantasy of what you would would do in a perfect world. And so often those obstacles are the um, the birth of some creative solution that's better than what it would, would have been without it. Um, and so necessity is the mother of invention is really what I was trying to say. So yeah, and so uh, the the rain and the constant, you know, there, there was just also the limitations with the budget and the schedule in that movie where uh, we, we were shooting 35 millimeter film on one camera and kept being told we are, are shooting too much film and have to shoot less. And um, so it was just a constant making solutions and, and being a director, learning to set the tone and to not freak out and to not melt down and to just be like, okay, looks like it's pouring rain again all day. And a scene in a day that we need to shoot, you know, 10 scenes that take place outside on a sunny day. So let's discuss how we're going to do this <laughs> and um yeah. we can move this one inside and we can shoot this one in the rain and whatever and you know i think that's something you do any director does all the time you're always just saying all right let's figure this out and hopefully as calmly as possible imagine in the hands of a, of many other filmmakers we just would have never seen what hot american summer come to life because you've Im- your ability to embrace spontaneity and actually it seems like you're able to bottle it up and to be used at leisure, this, like the, the magic of spontaneity. So, um, yeah, that's all. I mean, even in chaos, there's art. So I can see, like I say, I, I, you try to make the best of the situation and sometimes you get amazing things. It's definitely the marriage of chaos and structure. To, to, most of, most of wet hot American summer is not, uh, spontaneous at the moment. It's more spontaneous moments that got written down weeks, months, or years before and organized beforehand. <laughs> That's, that's amazing that it comes off the way it does. Yes. Now, now, speaking of Wet Hot American Summer, now it will return over a decade later to Netflix, of course, in the form of a two eight episode miniseries. Now, the follow ups were praised by fans and critics. But did you initially have concerns about revisiting something that so many people clo- hold close to their heart? How did you approach that? I had big concerns about it. Um, I felt like a big desire in a part of me to, to leave well enough alone and not to ruin something that was such a, a genie in a bottle and a, and a gem that we had come up with. Um, and yeah, I felt like all the reasons why reboots and revisits sometimes really suck. I, I thought about all of them and uh, I really was, sometimes I tried to talk to myself and Mike out of, out of doing it and say, oh, let's, you know, maybe let's just do a party or something instead of trying to actually remake more of it. But I think as we went through the process of just writing and thinking about it, I got so excited about the new storylines and the new ideas of where it can go. And the the very joke of using this tiny indie movie that has all these random jokes and using them all as like a Rosetta Stone of of canon and the idea of bringing back this same cast so so much older like all of it gave me kind of a joy and then 
at a certain point, I just decided, you know, it's worth doing and, and all we can do is be true to what this is, not try to pretend that we're the same people we were when we were, you know, 15 years earlier or mm -hmm. try to recreate anything, just continue the story in as true of a mindset as we did back then. And that's what we did. And, and I think it definitely could have gone haywire, but I, I ended up very happy with it. Yeah. I mean, coming from somebody that does hold the original close to his heart, I, I reserved any skepticism that I had about a remake because I saw your name, the uh, all the original cast members were coming back. <clears throat> so I had high hopes and it was, I was not let down at all. I mean, it was, I put it right up there with the original. Definitely. Now, Another one of your cult classics, The Ten, was released in 2007, a feature film made up of 10 short stories, each inspired by one of the Ten Commandments. Now, I saw Wet Hot, Hot American Summer was loosely based on the time you spent in summer camp as a kid. What inspired the idea for The Ten? I mean, obviously, other than the Bible. I had been uh, sitting around with Ken Marino trying to just think of different ideas for movies and we gave ourselves a little assignment once to just lock ourselves up for a week and come out of that week with a first draft for a movie. And we've done that a few times actually, and this was the first one. And so we just batted different ideas around and I had seen um, that movie, The Decalogue. Um, and so that was sort of a you know, similar idea, but, but not, not as comedic. And um, we were just thinking, what's a way to kind of do what we do, but in another way? And, and uh, the idea of these 10 stories each one inspired by one of the Ten Commandments formed from there. And then we just sort of scoured our mind and our notes and computer and, and you know, idea lists for different things that might fit into it and brainstormed and wrote and wrote and wrote. And that's that's how it came out. What I found cool about it was that people always see the Bible is up into interpretation. Well, that should mean if I'm painting it, writing a story about it, it should, you should be able to be who you are and write your story of what you feel the 10 were. So I told them I thought you guys were courageous in what you did, and I, I love how it came out. Oh, thank you. There were, uh, I want to preface this next question with two particular absurd moments in the movie that I absolutely loved. One was the um, in the last story where uh, the friend is he he pretty much says cut to ding dong as if he's reading the next lines in the script cut to ding dong i mean actually it would be and i thought that was that was beautiful because there's only a select amount of people out there that are really going to appreciate that joke that have seen scripts and could put themselves in the mindset of an actor that doesn't know when to stop reading the dialogue and then the other part that just blew me away every time I watch it, it catches me off guard is when the landlord is uh, showing Paul Rudd the apartment and he like flubs his line. He resets in his head. He takes it back. But both takes are in there. And I could only assume that that was like on purpose, either in the performance or at least in post-production. But what do you expect for 850 a month? The inner What you see is what you get. Well, what do you expect for 850 a month? The International Space Station mirror out there over there in outer space? So I was wondering with like moments like that, and your movie, are, your movies are full of these moments where not, a, not a, a moment is wasted. There's a joke that could be found everywhere. And some of them are so outside of the box. Like you said, just, you're just trying something. And like where how, how does that process work in your head like for for a moment like that where especially in a movie like the 10 it was always you know that was a playground where we could really take swings because you're telling 10 stories and it you know has it's obviously a a sketch oriented structure um but yeah. other you know it didn't stop us in other movies either where it had sort of just it was on the more absurdist side of the continuum and so to make those kind of meta jokes that I've just always gravitated towards, like the, as you said, the the cut to, you know, um, I think that sound. It's I I picture me sitting, typing it out with Ken Marino, and we're just like the, and then cut to, and then he says cut to, and it just part of the what I learned so early on about comedy is you just during the process you try a thousand jokes and then you winnow them down and winnow them down, winnow them down all the way through the shooting and the editing until you've got ones that all seem to work for you at least. 
the landlord thing was um, that really was just an actor who had had a lot of trouble. Uh, and um, so we had shot a bunch of different alts uh, and we're throwing, we were throwing him a lot of different lines to try. And he was really confused and just not even <laughs> sure what was going on. And so I remember sitting in the edit room with our editor, Eric Kissack, and it, the, we kept watching that clip of him screwing up just because it made us laugh so much. And then, of course, at one point, we're like, do we just put that in like it is? <laughs> and then we did. That is that perfectly aligns with what my expectations wanted. Successful to be. failure. Yeah, that, Definitely. Because yeah. <laughs> that's it's it just it plays so great. And I and I, I love that you are willing to do that to put something in there. And it there, I mean, I don't know if there's test audiences, you know, test audiences involved at some point, but not, not in a movie was, like that. I mean, I guess like very casual with a few friends, I guess. But the truth is that you, you know, as a filmmaker, if you're not looking for happy accidents, I mean, that's that's everything, you know. I mean, it's both. But you try to the happy accidents come at every phase. They might come in the first outlining, or on the set, or in the edit room, and you look for them wherever you can find them. Yeah, but I, but I mean, there's something that sets your movies apart in the sense that there's, you're not afraid to, to to put something in there solely because it makes you guys laugh, even if it's at the at the like the, at the cost of it being polarizing to an audience. Where like a lot of the times, like ah, this is only going to be like thirty seventy laughter in the theater. It's not worth right. it. But and, and you guys just go for it every the time. Laughter right. is so subjective anyway. And so, you know, yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I remember I went to screenings of Wet Hot American Summer where there was literally not a single peep from beginning to end and for an entire audience. It just depends on who it is and when and why, and even if it's the same exact movie. So knowing that my barometer is just me, you know, it's just like if, if I'm laughing, you know, especially after seeing something the hundredth time, if it still makes me smile or giggle, then I'm like, okay, let's, let's go for this. And you do, there is a, you know, as, as I started making bigger budget movies and, you know, you have to. You have to do the test screenings and you have to see what the audience responds to. And if nobody laughs at something, you got to really think about it. But there's definitely that balance of, you know, I, for some reason, I always remember there's a joke in role models where I come out and I'm like, oh, it sounds like a classic case of guy on the ground. And the, it's a kind of joke that some people, many people, probably more than half don't respond to. But the ones that do really like it, and so I'm like, okay, let's put a few of those in too. That's it's it's awesome when a filmmaker develops a really can develop a relationship with their fans through their material, and they continue to give their fans gifts that are kind of uh, special between you and the fan. And outsiders are just sitting there wondering why everybody is laughing. I mean, I thought they really swung for the fence in the ten when he had the rhino with the guy on the ground shirt on in the animation. I'm like, that's the guy on the ground on the rhino. They are going deeper than deep. This is some inception stuff going like on here. Fetishizing, <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like deep fan fetishizing of your own <laughs> Yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, I know we have uh, barely scratched the surface of your, uh, your totally impressive career, but I know you're extremely busy. We promise we keep this at, a, at 30 minutes. So we have... Um, we have four quick general general questions we just want to wrap it sure. up with. All right. So if, if there was some weird, obscure rule that restricted you to either only writing or directing for the rest of your career, which would you choose and why? Um, it's a tough question for me to answer because they are so overlapping. I think directing involves so much writing. And in a way, writing involves a lot of directing. And just like it, writing is really just setting up the blueprint for what you're going to do next. Um Two parts of the same process but if i uh, had to pick one i think i would i think i'm just i think directing comes easier to me and is more um if i had to pick one i would probably just be a director because I, I have enjoyed directing other people's material from time to time although it's mm -hmm. not my main thing that i've wanted to do but i i think interpreting writing and bringing it to life is definitely something that i could continue to be satisfied about if I even if I wasn't writing. That's awesome. Interesting. Um, as a filmmaker who had, you know, I mean, you've paved your own way into the industry. What is the best advice that you could give to uh, aspiring filmmakers, many of whom are probably inspired by your work? 
uh, that are just getting started? A lot of, you know, a lot of the specifics of the when I got into it are, you know, so many decades ago that it's hard to give advice about specific logistics. But I would say that in general, don't wait around for opportunities uh, and which today is so much is more available than ever to, you know the, the means of production anyone can have and uh, but I think to to follow both tracks of like doing your own thing as much as you can but also learning from people who've done it more um, mm -hmm. wh whether it's through you know reading and watching or through actual apprenticeship as, as much as you can and I think that um, just something I learned early on is quantity is as important as quality, especially early on. You just want to like keep trying, keep going to bat, don't be precious, um, write 10 screenplays, and you know that one of them is going to be better than if you had just written one screenplay. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Now, like I said, we're going to go ahead and get ready to let you go. But before you go, can you tell us uh, what we can look forward to from you if there are any projects in the works that, that you are at liberty to discuss? <laughs> Right now, it's an interesting uh, moment as we as we emerge from COVID. I have um, quite a few projects uh, cooking, and I'm trying to think if I have anything. I'm really not at liberty to discuss and yet, but they're they're coming soon. You can definitely, uh, if you go to davidwayne.com, I will always uh, post there first um, any news uh, about anything. Okay, and we'll Absolutely. be posting second. He'll post first. We'll post second. Yeah, right, there we go. And uh, <laughs> there and go. and. Uh, I'd also encourage people to check you out on Cameo because I went down the the list of songs that you do for people and it's almost like this whole other treasure trove of material that has not been seen yet of yours. There's a lot of music stuff you'll see on TikTok uh, and YouTube, uh, on my TikTok and YouTube too this year because I did a lot of just dicking around on the piano and stuff um, in, different, in different ways. Um, and I also do a semi... Uh, recurrent piano bar by request, sometimes on Twitch, sometimes on YouTube, sometimes on Instagram. Yeah, I saw on one of them, I can't remember if it was on Cameo or if it was on the piano bar on an Instagram live, but I, I, I was cracking up because you snuck in real subtly a daddy loves his little boy <laughs> when you were like getting your, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> listen, God, thank you so much, sir, for taking the time out. And listen, we really appreciate what you do. Uh, hopefully when we make it where you're at, we're just as cool and laid back and still awesome as you are, sir. Well, that's so nice of you guys to, to, to um, appreciate all the layers. It, it means a lot to me. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you for taking the time. Right. Take care, guys. Be well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer. Can you hear me and see me still? Yes. Daddy loves his little boy. Can you hear this piano? Yes. Yes. First of all. Okay, how about this? Who am I? And where do I go from here? Yeah. Thank you. So and that's much. the David Wayne.